Good evening and assalamu alaikum. Welcome to ThinkFest Conversations Online. Uh, my name is Yaqub Khan Bangesh. I'm the founder here at ThinkFest. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us tonight for a very special uh, session, uh, something that is very close to my heart and, of course, uh, very close to the heart of our panelists. Uh, today, we are going to discuss the life and legacy of one of the most illustrious sons of um, Punjab, uh, Lahore, uh, Sir Ganga Ram. Uh, with us, we have today uh, two great grandchildren of great great grandchildren of Sir Gangaram, uh, their illustrious ancestor. Uh, we have his uh, biographer with us, um, and our grand and our aim today really is to uh, not just talk about his life and legacy, but rediscover him in a modern way, in a way where he speaks to us today uh, as a Punjabi, as a Lahori. Uh, as someone whose uh, life and legacy we can use to promote good in the world, uh, good between India and Pakistan. Uh, you know, one of the most fascinating things that I really love about Sir Gangaram's leg legacy is that there's a Gangaram hospital in Lahore, but there's one also in Delhi. Uh, in the same way, his endowments are in Lahore and Amritsar and other, and other places too. So he is not just of Pakistan, he's equally of, of India also. Uh, of course, he lived a lot of his life, was born in what is now Pakistani Punjab, and then uh, lived a lot of his life in Lahore. And when he died, he gave practically everything that he had. Everything was willed uh, for the people of Lahore uh, and for their benefit. Uh, so I think there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to still rediscover here. So we have an amazing panel today. I shall kind of uh, begin clockwise here a bit. Uh, with us, we have uh, Dr. Paul Flather. Uh, he has been. Uh, he is a fellow at Oxford at Corpus Christi and Mansfield Colleges for 25 years. Um, he also headed the European network, uh, the the European uh, network uh, of leading uh, European universities for 17 years. He has been uh, a journalist um, and also a very, uh, I might use the word, educational entrepreneur. Uh, because he uh, was the founding CEO and Secretary General of the Central European University, uh, where actually Paul doesn't know I was a fellow in 2019, uh, towards, towards the end of it. Uh, so I had a wonderful uh, uh, three, four months in uh, Budapest just before they, they moved to Vienna. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Flather's great-grandfather, uh, great-great-grandfather was Sir Gangaram, but his mother also uh, made waves. Uh, she was the first Asian woman to be raised to the peerage in the House of Lords. Uh, she still remain very, uh, uh, remains very much active. Um, and one thing which I really would like to uh, mention about her is that she's worked quite a lot in uh, getting more recognition for uh, the South Asian uh, um, uh, sort of uh, soldiers and martyrs who actually participated in the world wars. That's a very important forgotten chapter of our history. And I think we are very grateful that uh, Banners Flather actually worked on it. Um, and I think that work still needs to con continue and redouble because, you know, those people did die for, you know, yes, for king and country, but also for our freedoms uh, that we uh, enjoy in these two countries and a lot of South Asia today. Uh, so, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paul Flather, for joining us today. Uh, then we have uh, Senator Kesha Ram Hinsdale now. Uh, she recently got married, so congratulations for that. Uh, she's had a long list of impressive things. So, you know, I'm I'm simply terribly imp impressed um, of her life. Um, at the age of 22, she was elected to the Vermont House of Representatives. Uh, she served there for a few terms and now is a state senator in Vermont. Uh, when she was elected, uh, she was the first person of color to be elected from Burlington uh, constituency. Uh, she's worked um, uh, on uh, the lives of battered women, and she's actually been, uh, um, you know, given them legal aid. And she's involved in in, in a number of other chari charities. But at the moment, she's of course focusing uh, herself uh, in her work as a state senator, and of course now recently married, uh, also. Uh, so we are very grateful. Uh, to her for actually taking time time out of her busy shed schedule. I think we've just timed it in between kind of her break so that we can you know sort of have this conversation with her. And of course, she she comes uh, again. Not only that she's a great great granddaughter of Sir Ganga Ram uh, herself. She had very interesting uh, ancest ancestry where uh, her one of her parents was actually Jewish also. So here we have sort of Indian Jewish, and, and I think uh, your father or grandfather or somewhere like you also owned an Irish pub. 
so you know there 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 are multiple connections there which i think are are really really fascinating and i think the other thing which which i would really like like to say is that i think it's really fascinating that the uh, descendants uh, um, are at great places in the uk and the us which actually shows uh, that this great person's legacy transcends um not just india and pakistan but uh, continents uh, fields you know you've got an academic here you've got an active pol- pol- politician here um and the real worldwide visionary view that sir gangaram has is i think very much reflected in the descendants that he has had and in conversation today with them uh, we have miss uh, uh, tamina ayub uh, better known as poonam so hence that that name there uh, she is at the moment writing a biography of sir gangaram uh which is the first bio- biography for decades for i for i think more than half a century and uh she also uh, comes from an illustrious family uh but uh, uh she has written a uh, very in- interesting books the latest one being the begum which is on the life of uh, rana liaquat ali khan who again had a very interesting heritage and then served as the first lady of pakistan but in fact had Uh, a lot of impact on on pakistan beyond the death of her husband uh, the first prime minister of pakistan and we owe it to poonam to actually show us the great myriad life of rana liaquat ali khan through her work and um, poonam has uh, has a post graduate degree in anthropology from the from the university of sussex uh, being married to a diplomat she has uh, lived all over the world new york rome cairo hague uh, all of the, these uh, places she's worked in in a number of NGOs on human rights issues uh but now she's focusing uh, more on bringing the people who have been kind of forgotten um or that there's a lot there is little public knowledge about them now uh, to the fore and of course she did a stellar work with uh, Rana Liaquat Ali Khan and now her next project is uh, Sir Gangaram uh, so we are very grateful that Poonam actually put together the the panel uh you know convinced uh his descendants to actually join us um and is writing this great biography you know that is something that i'm really really excited about because you know that is something that needs to be written in a modern way um uh, i read a biography of sir gangaram that was writ- written in 1940 so you know uh, a lot has to be covered in between in terms of his life and legacy too so thank you punam uh, very much for joining us um and thank you all and i think this will be a brilliant panel uh, i shall now disappear and hand it over to punam to um lead it from this point onwards thank you very much so i hope i'm audible um hello and welcome to paul and to kesha thank you so much for taking out time i know this has been scheduled for a long time and finally we are we are together so that's quite a relief you know that uh, we managed to coincide all the three of us three different continents um the same time and same day and whatever but i'm sorry about the delay i'm really very sorry i know it's very precious time for both of you and um so i don't know whether i should start by telling my side of the story or i guess i should do that so that, that therefore you can then ask me or or give your own views and opinions you see i uh, don't want to start with this sob story that oh he's forgotten or it's a forgotten legacy because that's not true it's really not true and uh, it's just a very simple matter you know there lahore or punjab has been a playground or battleground or whatever for many 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 you know centuries and we have the moguls and then we had the british coming over we had the sikh big sikh darbar but they all had historians remembering them so we had lots of accounts from everywhere somehow this period when the british took over and there were lots and lots of sons of the soil who became famous who took advantage who came forward with brilliant ideas brilliant work but somehow there was nobody there to sketch their work or record their work or so there was no historian talking about them like everybody about everybody else like ranjit singh or the moguls or so i feel that that's where the mistake lay and the and the children of today are not at fault of not knowing about him because nobody's told them nobody's written about them so sir gangaram i think is one person among quite a few in that period had would really done a lot and a lot of lot for lahore and for punjab at, uh, you know in a in a larger sense but nobody wrote about them uh, there was um, i can think of a lot of people who really got no biographer or any mention he is very lucky that he had this very devoted friend called um, you know bedi pyare lal bedi 
who really did a great biography in 1940, I must admit. There was another gentleman called Mr. Bhatti, Dr. Bhatti, who did another work about 20 odd years ago. But that was like more of a catalog of his works and not the flavor and the mood of him as a person and what led him to all these you know, fantastic uh, projects and missions. So I just felt that there was a little lacuna there and I must try and bring everything back together so that he there's a you know there's a picture of him in a complete sense which he he needs to have because he had so many aspects to him so many amazing aspects to him that it's it's just really actually difficult to pull all the thread, threads and put them into one volume which is what i'm trying to do so i don't know what uh, is uh, kesha's feeling about this i know she's been dwelling on it for a while she's been in touch with some people in lahore she's very keen to come here I know that Paul's mother has come about three or four times uh, and she's been around, but I think Kesha is done now. And also Paul's, of course. I won't uh, say that Paul should not come. Paul must come. And an occasion I've been, that... I've been many times. You are not. You haven't. When I, I, met, you been, in Jaipur, when I met you in Jaipur, you said you've never been. No, no, I've been no, no, four, four times. You have. Each time your mother came, you mean you came? No, no, I came. Uh, I came. I was the guest of um, Benazir Bhutto. I had okay. a, an official visit. I went to Gangapur. And I have to put one thing on the record. Uh -huh. you know. mm -hmm. um, but before I do, I, Kesha, just give me a moment. I'll, I'll pass to you. I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be talking about such a wonderful exemplary figure. I mean, it would be a pleasure regardless that he happens to be an ancestor. That's just a bonus. I mean, he's just an outstanding human being, very inspiring. So thanks to, to Jacob and his team. And thanks to you for uh, focusing on this. No, no, I, I actually spent some time in, in his model village, Gangapur, and so on. The thing I need to tell you about is that Mr. Bhatti has uh, was uh, has stolen my, my... I did some research. I uh, <laughs> gave a lecture in London, which was very well attended, mm. in which he helped to organize it, and he then took my materials. And I've never seen the book, but um, he turned it into, a, I mean, you know, very, very irritating. But anyway, it's a great pleasure to, to, to be here. And I'm very keen on the man and have given some talks and things on him. So yeah, looking forward to coming again when the when it's possible. Great, 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 great. Yeah, I was just going to tell you about the occasion. But anyway, let Kesha talk first and I'll talk yeah, about that. No. <laughs> yes, Kesha, love to hear what you have to say or what you feel about this sort of thing in Pakistan. There is a lot of fervor, I can assure you, even now about him and talking about him and you know touch wood yes it, it carries on legacy carries on absolutely well um punam auntie it might help if you mute yourself if if i don't know if your son is still there but they're perfect i think if we each mute ourselves when another person's talking it'll help um it's an it's an honor and a privilege to be here with both of you um and particularly my now I know that on the in the Western Hemisphere, we keep better track of second cousin once removed or whatever it might be uh, for myself and Paul, but it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to join him because I would uh, say he easily has more of the academic and historical point of reference for our great, great grandfather, Sir Gangaram. And unfortunately, I think for the part of the family that made it to the United States, um, you know, we didn't have the benefit of knowing that that Sir Gungaram had traversed our particular land and communities as he had London and the UK. And we really lost a, a connection to Lahore and that legacy. Um, you know, I can just say that my father, who was noted earlier, owned an Irish pub with my Jewish American mother in Los Angeles. You know, he, he went by Mike and he had to... Um, kind of manage his identity as a small business owner with the name and history that he had. And I think there was also a lot of pain. Um, my, if you look, you know, as uh, as Paul's mother, my Buaji, Srila, Baroness Srila Flather would say, you know, I am the daughter of the oldest son of the oldest son of the oldest son of Sir Ganga Ram, and that's not always a good thing. Bless my ancestors, <laughs> but you know, sometimes what that means is they 
stayed too long. They held on too tightly to things when they needed to strike out elsewhere. And so, you know, my, my family stayed through quite a bit of the tragic loss of a lot of the legacy and land in Lahore. And it made it very hard for them to talk about it. So you, if, if you can imagine when I was a uh, prospective student at the University of Vermont in Burlington, Vermont, all the way across the country from my home, I met a professor named Dr. Salim Ali, who happened to be from Lahore. And he said, oh, your name is Indian. Where's your family from? I said, well, they're Punjabi. But originally they were from the part of India that became Pakistan. They're from Lahore. He said, do you happen to be related to Sir Gangar? I said, actually, I have a biography of him. That's all I know and have because he's my great, great grandfather. And the second, the next thing he said was, can I call my family right now? And I thought, what is happening? Why, why would he want to call his family? So he got, you know, his mother, his aunts, his relatives on the phone to say, I'm sitting with the great, great granddaughter of Sir Ganga Ram. I still have no idea what his legacy means to the, you know, a, a Muslim Pakistani professor in Vermont who, you know, is, is overjoyed by this point. And then he, you know, after this bit of celebration was the one to explain to me, we still say a prayer to him every day. We still live with the benefits and bounty of his legacy. And many, many people appreciate that legacy in Lahore. And this was all very new to me as a, as a teenager. Um, so you can imagine after every election or every time my name appears um, in the press on the other side of the pond, um, and particularly in the Indian press, I have thousands of new connections on social media, um, people who reach out and tell me that they are a doctor or they are an engineer or they are a proud, you know, Lahori because of his legacy. And that means a tremendous amount. And they represent all political and religious and ethnic backgrounds. And I think that's really what's important about his legacy, especially in a pandemic is that he didn't care what religion or background you you had. You deserved water and a place to live and access to medicine and education, and particularly for women, um, and uh, to have a purpose in life. And, you know, sometimes in politics, we get into, you know, a lot of disagreements, but that really is what it comes down to. And it's how he lived his life and, and left an incredible legacy for, for people all over the world. So that's, um, yeah, that's, that's, as you know, uh, he has um, uh, his uh, Samadhi in Lahore. And recently, it's going to be open to public again after about maybe 15 years. And there's obviously going to be a big fanfare. So that's when I thought you people should definitely try and come and attend that's that important ceremony. Because I don't know why it remained closed for all these years. I know that 1992, there was a crisis in um, all the way in um, Babri Masjid. And uh, the impact was felt here by people coming and breaking things and destroying a part of it. And, uh, you know, then they just locked it up. They were insecure. So then it, it's really never opened after that. And now they're going to, they're actually they're busy painting it and doing it up. It looked fine when I went there last year. It was in good shape. Uh, but of course, I had to get somebody to climb over the gate and, you know, get it open from inside. And it was just, uh, then they found the chokidar somewhere. So I think now it'll be a proper maybe ticketed entrance and everybody will be able to come hopefully and no more of you know i think i think um, this is um a sign of the increasing interest in in someone like uh, gangaram i think the trust was quite true. neglectful you know the, the money true. wasn't well spent even though there was a legacy there um so i think that's a wonderful sign i mean i must say i must echo some of the uh, stories that kesha said i mean i did sorry that that i that we got confused but i have been around i spent quite a long time visiting some of the buildings and things that um uh sagangaram built and i can remember that when i went to the hospital and they found out that um i was a relative the taxi driver kindly wouldn't take any any money you know because of the because of the connection um mm. and when i went to the hospital i actually went to find out about him and i arrived there and all the senior consultants and the um 
head of the hospital and so on, they'd all gathered in a room and I got out my notebook in a kind of journalistic way that I was used to. And they all, there was kind of silence and they all looked at me and I looked at them <laughs> and no one was speaking and they said they wanted me to speak, you know. So I shared whatever knowledge I had, but really they'd forgotten. And this goes back to, to, to your original point. Um, they had actually, the, the, the hospital, and I don't think this is unusual for institutions, they, they'd forgotten about the founder. They, they had one small uh, image of him. They had obviously the inscription on the outside, um, but they were so eager to hear, hear the stories. And I think there's this famous story, isn't there, when um, Zia, um, when he, in his kind of um, drive to Islamify things, had actually proposed that the name of the hospital be changed. Yes. And the citizens, citizens of Lahore just de declined, you know, and if, if, the new, if the new name was used, then taxi drivers wouldn't take you there, even if you were <laughs> sick. You had to, you had to, uh, so that's, a, that's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrific story. There are lots of stories like that that one could share. I, I, I do get it here in England. You're right. There are more uh, people from Lahore in the UK and, um, you know, taxi drivers here, um, you know, when we chat and we, when I use my, clumsy Urdu and so on, and uh, we can chat about it. But I can tell you this, they don't waive the fee. I keep looking at them and thinking they'll waive the taxi fee. But, uh, it's not like the hall. but he is a wonderful man, and I think he is modern. And I think he's modern because he does, he, he was ahead of his time, wasn't he? He, he promoted gender, yes. he promoted inclusiveness in the sense that we would love to return to uh, you know, good relations between Hindus and Muslims, and he promoted an understanding of, of welfare, and he was so aware of poverty. You know, he didn't, he, he, he wanted, he, he didn't discriminate in, in that sort of status sense against poor people. He valued them. He saw their, their value, their importance. He wanted to, in his interest in schools, he, and you might, some people might take offense on this, but he wanted the schools to focus on 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 simple curriculum which would provide opportunities for work which would allow uh, people to go and, and and get jobs and and you know as he said fill bellies i mean he wanted people to be able to fill their bellies that was vi vital for him and it's so rational and so thoughtful and so practical anyway back to you punam yeah so you were talking about the hospital and the fact that you managed to get there with the taxi this is what makes me very upset is that whenever I take his name, the only thing people mention is, oh, the Sangha Gangaram Hospital. I said, look, he was much beyond that. He did so much that it's not, it's not funny. And as you said, he was very aware of the need for education, health, welfare, the poverty. You know, because as you know, being his uh, you know, great-grandchildren, he had a tough life himself to start with. And he was very aware of the, you know, the, the hardships that one goes through trying to get into through school, through college. He was on scholarships. He would share his money with his parents so they could live a little better. So he was, he was he had been through all that. So he thought that, you know, it's very important that he must keep that in mind and try and help. And then, of course, this overriding thought in his head was always until the end that I'm not earning for myself. I'm earning to help people who need this help. And uh, so by the time... At the 20s, it was in the 1920s, he had a lot of money from his agriculture uh, sort of, you know, um, ventures. And he was, he did, he just knew that now that now is the time. So he began the Vidva Ashram, the Buddhist Ashram in 1920, 21. It flourished. He started schools there, industrial homes for training women, because he was very keen to lift women. And as you know, the, the his, his, his desire to stop widow, uh, you know, tyranny towards widows was his, you know, like his mission. And he really succeeded in a big way. And, you know, then he, of course, when he had a, an accident in England or something, he said, you know, it's these widows who've been praying for me. And I got saved because they prayed for me. I thought that was so sweet. And um, then, of course, he started right in the last year of his life, the handicapped home, the home for the infirm, right next to the widow's ashram. And one day he was sitting there. I believe there was a nice garden in the middle where the, you know, the old people come and sit and relax and listen to music. He said, this is where I want my samadhi to be. So that's where it ended up being, as you know. And uh, the, the, ash, the Apahaj Ashram is gone, but the samadhi is there. And uh, till 47, uh, sadly, 
it was the venue for very big festivals every 13th of April, being his birthday, being the new year, Besaki. So all the people would gather. So it was a festive occasion, remembering him, even though he was gone. There was a lot of joy. And as you know, he touched so many lives that everybody was grateful and wanted to come and say thank you. On that occasion, I was just reading the last pages again of Pyarelal Bedi's biography and the way he describes, you know, the, the, the his, his death. It's like not a normal person's death. I mean, the kind of pouring of grief and, you know, people and the crowds, and it was August, uh, it was July, sorry, and it was very, very warm. And uh, yet it didn't stop people from pouring from all parts of Punjab and congregating in this this little place in, uh, it was called, what what is it called, the area? I just forgotten. But anyway, that's a, it's still a very, very crowded area, unfortunately, and the garden is gone, everything is gone. It's just surrounded by homes, all, all four sides, which is so sad. There is a, the Ravi River just flew by and it's, of course, changed its course in the meantime and it's gone off. So it's not flowing there anymore. But anyway, Samadhi has got a very, very powerful spiritual feeling to it. You know, when you go there, you just, it's so palpable, you know, because he was so present in, 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 in real life, in, in helping and doing things and being concerned about so many, many things, uh, so many aspects. And uh, as you know, agriculture, the engineer, the architect, and then the philanthropist who did so much for people that it's um, that just in, in itself can fill a book, fill a whole book. And uh, so it's difficult to sort of condense everything in to one book. But I'm trying. So, anything um, more? Um. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I thought I would um, just build on what what Paul has said because. Um, I, part of the reason that the story of my connection to him went viral was the U.S. consulate in Lahore, uh, mm -hmm. put out the story and that reached a lot of Pakistanis and I was really honored. True, true, that, true. Yes. Yeah. I think it reached you. Um, yes. you know, so <laughs> it, it was wonderful to follow up with a, um, uh, engagement with women in Lahore and around mm -hmm. the area who wanted to talk about his legacy. And one of the things that uh, I really wanted to highlight in that conversation is that, you know, for over a century ago, Sir Gangaram focusing on the empowerment of women and their ability to lead purposeful, um, economically stable lives and even access education and become healthcare providers demonstrates that the West does not have the market cornered on women's empowerment and women's leadership. Um, my father used to say that often because he saw a lot of gender parity uh, in, in South Asia that was frankly lost during the Victorian period in Britain that you know imperialized India. And I think it's a really important reminder to people that um, Sir Gunga Ram was working to build universal mobile access to healthcare and you know schools for girls and colleges for women at a time when you know the West was really quite frankly keeping women um, cloistered away and in the dark and without the same access to economic empowerment. Um, so his you know his legacy should be a reminder to all of us that you don't have to be in a certain country. Um, or in a certain political, under a certain political regime to fight for the rights of everyone around you to have a place in society and in the community. Mm. Okay, now I, I, I want to... Oh, sorry, go on. Sorry. No, Papa, please. Yeah, you're, you're well, no, no, I was going to say that uh, I, I, I very much agree. I mean, one of the th there's so many things to admire about him. I, one of the things I really like is how he, when he saw a problem, he tried to solve it in, in a way that produced a solution. So there is this uh, story that when he was working on the Darbar um, for uh, King King George, you know, Darbar, yeah, yeah, he had to he had to finish something um, overnight because they were running late, and they couldn't get the materials across a, a canal system. So he devised uh, uh, he, they built a sort of um, faux bridge overnight. And they managed to get the materials over. So when uh, you know when Curzon and others were 
woke up in the morning, the problem had been solved. Now, I'm only telling that story because it, it, it's about problem solving. Now, much more significant is, is for example, uh, reclaiming all the wasteland in Punjab, which you mentioned, the irrigation systems that he produced. I mean, they're major problems. Land was being wasted. Something like 40% of, of the Punjab land was, was, was not in use. And, and he could see that there might be methods of, of, uh, of developing that. And he brought all his experience and training from his time at Bradford. He spent two years in England in Bradford at uh, learning about waste and water drainage. And he learned, he, he brought a system, uh, they'd actually imported a irrigation pump, which was then copied and adapted in, in the way that we're very good at in India. And, and adapted to local conditions, and he managed to, you know, in a sense, reclaim the Punjab and, and irrigate it. Now that's it's it's about his problem solving that is so so terrific. I mean, um, uh, I like his. Uh, I, I I I think he is a modernist. I think Yaku began the talk by saying, you know, let's think of him as someone who has lessons for us today, and he has lessons for us in terms of his exclusiveness of, of women, of elderly, and so on. He has. Uh, but it, it's also, you know, just tackling a problem and being practical and getting on with it. So when he saw all those wonderful buildings in Lahore, Poonam, which we so enjoy, but then he saw that the sewer system was absolutely <laughs> dreadful. And, mm. you know, his, his attention to health obviously manifested in the, in the ultimately in the, in the hospital, but he cared about health and he could see, and there was plenty written about it, uh, that, that this was dreadful. So he set about uh, renovating the, the sewer system, and it made a huge difference to the prosperity of Lahore because Lahore had been a great city, you know, had been really a, a great city, but was in decline relative to Amritsar, relative to Delhi, and it, through the 1880s, through his work, you know, it began to rise. But if it hadn't had a decent sewer system, then uh, who knows? Also, also water, water supplies for Lahore were enhanced greatly in the 1880s by him uh, when the British felt that they just couldn't handle the you know, work there, the buildings, the construction, and he managed to create a lot of water supply through the Ravi by, you know, his his expertise in water. His and, canal uh, systems and things, absolutely. Yeah. But, I mean, what an amazing guy. I mean, I, we're all we're all sharing this thought, but, you know, today, if one of us does something amazing, you know, success in politics, success in academe, success in uh, journalism, you know, whatever, it, it's terrific. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you can do two professions. Sometimes you can do three, but that's remarkable. But here's here's a man who you know his range was yes, yes. absolutely unbelievable, phenomenal. Yes, his grasp and his range. Well, I I've, I've just in, interjected because I could not keep myself away because this is like so close to uh, kind of you know all of our hearts. So I was like, okay, I shall come back also. But let me just 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 add one one thing here. We have just had a very uh, interesting message. Uh, from the deputy commissioner in Okara, who's actually mentioning the fact that, you know, of course, the, the, the Renala power generation project is actually under her yeah. domain. So she has very uh, kindly uh, invited all of us uh, whenever <laughs> Paul and Kesha visit, but 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 Punyam is uh, slightly nearby. Uh, uh, for us to actually for come there. But I think that, again, reinforces the whole idea that this was such a multifaceted person who actually did so much in so many multiple ways. And there's a question here that I actually want to uh, uh, put to both Poonam and uh, Paul, that, that people really find uh, fascinating about Gangaram is that he kind of succeeded at the, you know, at the high noon of the British Empire, right? This was the time that the British were controlling everything. Indians weren't really participating in uh, self-government. In fact, when he retired and only after that, Indians actually began to participate here. But here you have a very different example of an Indian actually making more of a mark than perhaps a lot of Indian politicians who actually did help self-government and really didn't do much. Uh, so can we see Gangaram as a very different model that even if you are under a colonial, uh, a, a, a colonial government, one, that government recognizes your work, it makes you a Rai Bahadur, it then makes you, uh, you know, uh, knights, knights you, uh, it, does, it does that. And then it also empowers you in a particular way to actually make all these changes because... 
uh, uh, environment enabled Gangaram to do all of this. So Poonam and uh, Paul, if you can perhaps talk, talk, talk about that, because that's a question that we've received. So I thought I'll sort of uh, put this to you guys. I, shall I go first, Poonam? Can I just tip in some thoughts? I mean, I, I think that, I think it's a very important point. And, and I would explain it by saying that I think he wasn't political with a capital P. Um, he he he's, he was practical and rational, and so he did see the importance of. I mean, to use the phrase again, filling bellies. He did he did rationalize. He did want to solve problems before he thought that you could have the the kind of freedoms and rights. Now you might be criticized for that, um, but that was how he saw things. I mean, after all, he was a scientist. He was an engineer. And that is, um, you know, it's a bit simplistic, but you remember C.P. Snow talked about the two, the two courses in life, uh, and that scientists do think differently from from the arts and the humanities people. And I think that he did see that. I mean, he he didn't agree with Gandhi's approaches on on several occasions, and he was, uh, I mentioned it earlier in his his educational philosophy. He was practical, so he did build. A, a college of commerce. He did. He, he emphasized the technical and vocational education, um, and ultimately, and perhaps to his own surprise, he found himself, as Puna mentioned, very wealthy. And of course, wealth does allow you to then uh, do political things. So probably, you know, he he um, he, he was a little early in the in the freedom movement. But I think it's more the fact that he was a scientist and a problem solver and a practical man that meant that he didn't, in a sense, fire up politically. But in the end, as you rightly say, he, he achieved, you know, as much or more maybe because he could do so. Those are some thoughts. Poonam, did you want to? I didn't. Am I unmuted? Um, yes, I'm unmuted. OK. Yeah. The what? Yakub said rings true, but at some point, as we all know, in um, at the time of his retirement, he did take premature retirement uh, because he had been bypassed and he was not promoted for being a native engineer, even though he was absolutely one of the most outstanding ones. So he did not make any noise. He did not protest. He just quietly resigned. And that's when the next phase of his life began. And he became a rich man only after that. Because till then, he was honestly and earnestly working for the government and not thinking about himself. He barely had time to build his family a house. He got a year to do some work on the railways from Amritsar to Patan Court, And that's the year he spent building their house, you know, and gave them a better house to live in. There was They were a much larger family by that time, you know, his own kids and his own, you know, other family members. So, um, yes, and uh, I think that uh, that was something that he didn't really live down. Uh, he felt very... Sore, but he did not ever talk about it. He just, in a dignified fashion, carried on with all the other things he wanted to do. He went to Patiala for seven years immediately after his retirement. He spent seven very, very, you know, successful years with them and did a lot of work there. And uh, so I feel that, yes, there were a lot of British who actually were very, you know, ad you know admiring of his work. Um, in fact, Sir Haley was there on his uh, memorial after his death at his at his samadhi talking about him in glowing terms because he deserved every bit of that you know so, but it's not it's not something that was generally at the government level that it should have been um, of course Curzon thought a lot of him previously when he did the 1877 darbar which was some called something else um, coronet no just called something else i'm just forgetting right now of course he got admiration for that and as you said, even there, a lot of problem solving went on because it was something that was happening for the first time on that scale. And he was able to do it just by himself and a team of just, you know, basic workers. And uh, that's how he got the next uh, assignment in 1903. Uh, or was it 1901, I think, the, the coronation ceremony, which was, again, brilliantly successfully carried out. And even then, he didn't get his promotion, which was really what shocked him. So, yes. Uh, Yes and no <laughs> to Yakub. <laughs> but there's something else I wanted to ask, which is not really relevant anymore. But being the kind of rational person he was, he organized his life and his work in a fashion that he gave one son the work of all the agriculture and the Gangapur project. So he had an assistant there who was there on the, 
you know, spot all the time, even if he had to travel away. And the second son, when he began to think of how to, you know, industrialize agriculture so that, you know, it became more rational, more earning, he started small units and plants of, you know, cotton ginning and sugar, uh, you know, factories. And his other son uh, took charge of that. Now, Sevakram, Rai Bahadur Sevakram, is supposed to be the eldest son who took over the agriculture. But Kesha was not sure that was the case. I remember we had this discussion. She said, no, no, he's the second son. So Dalat Ram is, I know that was the father, I'm sorry. I'm talking, thinking about the second son who also built the hospital, uh, the Jinnah Hospital, the Fatma Jinnah Medical College. The hospital, of course, was built by the, all the children later. As you know, it, it opened later. But what I'm saying is now, who was the eldest son and who was the second son? And maybe and that's why I was trying to get hold of Paul in the beginning when I started the book. But Paul was elusive. I couldn't get hold of him. I said, OK, I'll just stick with the narrative in the books. And the book said Sevakram was the oldest. And I thought his mother might throw some light that that was not the case, you know. So can one of you tell me a little bit about that? So maybe I can still correct <laughs> the narrative in my book. That's a, that's a bit technical. I mean, I can I can ask my mom again. We must have a we must have a, a family tree somewhere. Um, the person who has it um, was Dharamvir, who was the secretary to Nehru, who was uh, a, another relative, um, who who um, is responsible for having the Gangaram Hospital built in Delhi in his honor. That was, uh, you know, after after the family, and this is where my mother fled, uh, along with the rest of the family in '47 in partition, because we, the house was surrounded and we were under a lot of stress and pressure and were losing everything um, in in partition times. Um, so basically, this our side of the family um, left and, and and had to restart again in in in, in Delhi. Uh, we were obviously welcomed and things improved and then my uh, grandfather eventually uh, gets to brazil as the indian representative senior representative in brazil um and, and a whole new chapter starts but i um i i know that durhamvir did prepare a um a family tree so i'll try and get get hold of that if i can and we can we can double check these things but probably it's a little too technical for this this um <laughs> it does it does um I mean, it does go back to a nice point that Kesha made at the beginning, which is how how his legacy has, in a sense, unfolded internationally. I mean, not only, I mean, obviously in those days, India, Pakistan and India were sort of India, there was greater India. Um, but then through India and then through, through, um, through the global connections that we have and that we can spread the word and so on. I think that's, that's quite uh, terrific. Um, what else can we show it to? Are there any more questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if I can put a put a put a question to Kesha. Uh, now, in a way, uh, what you know, as as Paul also mentioned, that Sir Gangaram was like you know non-political with a with a capital P kind of thing. So you are you know in that sense you are doing something completely opposite. But in a way, in uh, your life, you have actually you know picked up. Things that you know, Sir Gangaram was very interested in in the life of uh, women who are in trouble. You worked with battered women. Uh, that is ex exactly what you know, Sir Gangaram really worked 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 on. At that time, his interest was also very much in terms of uh, widows. Uh, and I really find it fascinating that at a, at a time where there was such resist uh, such resistance to widow re remarriage, he actually devoted a large part of his uh, money. Uh, to uh, widow re remarriage and really trying to push for it. And even in his uh, uh, trust will, it actually very clearly says that, you know, widow remarriage is one of our main, main plans. Uh, so his ideas about the role of women in society, his ideas about, uh, you know, how women should live their, 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 their life and everything. Uh, if you could perhaps comment a bit on that, that how can that kind of inform uh, not just your life, but also political life in general. You know, what can we learn from Gangara's Ram's life that can inform a political platform? In fact, create a political platform. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I want to I want to start by 
returning to this idea of the family tree and who showed up where, who received what in, in the lineage, um, because our family tree, I think, became uh, um, broken to the point that we didn't know how many um, how many people around the world might be uh, carrying out Sir Gungoram's legacy in a similar way. And this came to a fine point for me when we were in um, Delhi for my Dottie G's um, passing and we were stopping to see family on the way to perform her final rites in Hardwar. And I had um, one, of, one of her sisters, my Dottie G, um, you know, pulled me aside. I had just been elected a couple years before to the legislature. And in Indian culture, as people can appreciate, politicians are not looked upon particularly favorably. Um, so, you know, it wasn't like everybody was celebrating. In fact, my own grandmother said, I wish you had become a musician. She would have rather <laughs> that I was singing on a street corner than in politics. Um, and this particular, you know, great aunt of mine, my daddy G said, you know, you have, you have an aunt in the UK and she's the first South Asian woman appointed to the House of Lords. I said, no, nobody's ever told me that. <laughs> and um, she, she gave me an article about Paul's mother, Baroness Srila Flather, and it highlighted that she was in, got in an argument, you know, someone kind of pushed her out of the way and argued with her on the tube in London that her family had never done anything to help the country, you know, to help the UK, to help help in the conflict, probably this person was referring to as World War II. And of course, as Paul can tell you better than I, um, you know, her father and some of our other ancestors had a great impact and, and it just demonstrated great bravery and sacrifice in World War II and other conflicts. And Indians and other Commonwealth uh, country natives never got credit for their role in, uh, you know, the sacrifices they made. In fact, the Baroness will tell you Indians had the second greatest number of casualties after the British on the Allied side. And so she worked with Prince Charles to create a monument to all of the people who never got credit. So I'm reading this, learning I have this aunt in the UK, learning she and, you know, her sons have done what they can to articulate and celebrate the legacy of Sir Gungaram. And I'm thinking, we've always had politicians in the family. We've always had people who cared for those who are left behind and tried to bring them in and share their stories to make sure their legacy was not forgotten. And in fact, the Baroness and I are not in the same political party by any means. Um, you know, she has become more of an independent in UK terms. Um, when I first reached out, she was deciding, I think, to move from the more conservative side. I'm seen as quite liberal and I'm also in Vermont, which is quite liberal in, in the US. And yet when I visited her, she would she would tap on the shoulder every security guard in the parliament building. She would go say hi to every cafeteria worker. She looked for everyone that gets forgotten and left behind and said hello. And I thought we are related and we're absolutely Roms. You know, even for my wedding, one of my aunts who married my uncle Ashwin Ram, my um, my Chachaji, you know, she I was saying I want everyone to feel taken care of and I want this to happen, this to happen. She said, you're such a Rom. You're always trying to figure out how to take care of any everyone else. And I had never quite heard it framed that way. But, you know, the ROMs continue to live a life of service and to think about who gets left out of the equation. And whether that's in politics or medicine or academia or, you know, building a statue or passing a law, that's still the legacy that we have from Sir Gangaram. What he was doing was political um, because it was showing people a different way, and particularly with widows, it, you know, the bar barbaric idea that a woman should, you know, be on the funeral pyre of her husband um, was also an economic idea. It was the idea that there was nothing left for her, you know, once her husband was gone, there was no one to take care of her, she would be a burden on society. And it's a political and economic, you know, leader who says, there, there has to be a better way. And we can show, you know, we can change policy, we can change their availability of resources so that someone doesn't have to make a barbaric economic choice that's not really a choice at all 
um, you know, to, to end their lives because no one is there to take care of them. And he changed that political, social, and economic reality for women in a way that, you know, no other politicians were doing at the time and maybe haven't after. And so that is an incredible legacy and it's a political one as well as social and economic. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's very true and very very well put. I should have said at the beginning that my, my mother apologizes that she couldn't join us, Poonam, but she does oh, send us, she does send us uh, blessings. She's she's um, she's getting fitter. She's getting better. Oh, um, good. And of course, she uh, as uh, I mean, she she has lived. She's living out uh, the legacy. Um, she when she was a child. I mean, the stories of Dangaram around the dinner table were li alive were you know were direct were, were from people who who knew him mm -hmm. and the whole family was brought up in a in a sense of pride and respect and i think that has washed over her and she couldn't have expected that she would um be able to deliver on it because you know as as a as a young teenager very controlled she talked she's talked a lot to me about how how limited and controlled the lives of young women were they you know they're escorted everywhere not able to do something one of her great pleasures was to go to the cinema when they went to Missouri in the summer holidays but on the way she would get the servant to take her to the roller skate park you know and she, that was a sort of thing that she couldn't tell her her mom um you know that was a, that was a great kind of freedom so you know you can imagine how restricted life was but then she broke out by accompanying her father to Brazil because her, her mother was a devout Hindu and wouldn't actually um, uh, leave India and, and, and you know, give up on the, on the sort of daily puja routines and, and, the, and the temple visits. So she went as her escort, as his escort, although she obviously had to go to school and she actually ended up at school at St. George's in uh, Buenos Aires. It was a great liberating time for her because she was, in a sense, acting hostess at some of the, the functions at the at the at the um, Indian, um, you know, diplomatic um, uh, uh, embassy would be too grand a word because we were still 1948. We were still building ourselves up, but we did host parties and things, and 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 she was organising them. So you know. That was when she built up those skills, and uh, Kesha can testify to her very warm and welcoming personality and, and, and confidence that she has in social relations, um, including you know meeting and chatting to every security guard. I'm going to just echo that because when I go around college, you know, I'm always looking out for the porter. I'm always looking out for the the gardener. Um, one of the gardeners at Corpus Christi, who's now about 85, is still one of my best mates. Um, but more than some of the fellows and even one or two of the presidents. So, you know, that, that maybe that is a ROM. Maybe that is a ROM quality to look out. I, I know there's a famous phrase that uh, Gangaram said, you know, I'd rather a poor man at the head of a canal is worth more than a rich man at the tail of a canal. You know, it's a sense that, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's what you do and what you stand for and what you believe in rather than your status, which is a contrary idea to South Asian culture. In South Asian culture, by and large, we have to admit, status is hugely powerful. People, people spend a lot of their energy, finance, uh, time building up status. So, you know, to, to have a man who, who doesn't believe in that and, and, you know, I mean, I, can I just also say, well, I've got the the floor that you know we've talked a lot about is philanthropy philanthropy wasn't common philanthropy isn't still isn't common enough i mean i know that very rich people found universities and things but as i worked with george soros for many many years i mean you know if you're very rich you can give a lot and it still doesn't mean much to you you know it's, it's the proportion of your income so he gave as you as you said Puna, you know virtually all his fortune away even Absolutely. upsetting some of his family members, you know, yeah. even surprising some of his family members. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was a terrific example. And to share it with across society, not to be favoring, you know, your community, 
your group. I, I just think that's uh, just terrific, really. So um, yes, and and please, you're all invited to. We'll come, We'll have a special visit to the memorial to the to the soldiers, which stands on Hyde Park Corner. Um, there is a there is a ceremony there every March. So if you time your visit to to Britain uh, around um, around March the twentieth, then we have a big big uh, Commonwealth ceremony, uh, remembering all the the fallen soldiers. And my mother started it for for Indian soldiers, and then realized that you know it, it wasn't possible. It had to be for Pakistani soldiers and for Sri Lankan soldiers and for Bangladeshi soldiers and for Nepali soldiers. Nepali. And then of course all the Caribbean. Um, high commissioners came along and said, why can't it be for our people as well? And then the African commissioners came along. So it's actually, um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, a, 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 a memorial, you know, initially for, for um, greater Indian soldiers, but also for all non-white soldiers, for all black soldiers who, are, who have been forgotten. I'm very proud to be um, given the legacy to run this Noon Foundation, which allows me to bring yes. uh, uh, brilliant young Pakistanis to, to Britain. I mean, you know, that's that's been terrific. And through that, I sort of, I don't know, I emphasize, I, I think of Sanganga Ram every time we have, you know, our meetings and things. And when I see these young kids doing well, you know, we had one Pakistani scholar, he had 27 O-levels. I don't know if you know, uh, that's, the, that's the sort of, grade at 15 or 16 Kesha and he had um, he had 11 a levels and he went to Cambridge and he was a you know he's a blooming genius and we had him for our reception I always try and give a little reception at, at Oxford and Cambridge for our scholars and we asked him why only 27 and it was a tongue-in-cheek and he said there was no one left who could teach me anything more oh <laughs> Anyway, I don't know if Yakub knows about the foundation or the trust, the Karnesar Trust for Education. Do you know about it? Yes, he does know about the Noon Trust. Okay. Yakub? We didn't mention it at all in reference to your mama, to your mother. I know that she's, and you are now looking after it for her. With her, or rather, no, no, my mother's not been involved. I, I, um, no, no, she's not anything that Paul does. No, yeah, no, it was, um, it was the, it was the lovely Vicky Noon, the, the wife yes, of the first yes. Vicky Prime Noon. Minister. She met me, actually, on this trip that I did with. Um, I had the, we had this official trip with uh, Benazir Bhutto, um, was hosting. I, I knew Benazir as a student, at Oxford. Uh -huh. And um, so when she became prime minister, she and I brought the vice chancellor over. And there was this wonderful occasion um, when um, the vice chancellor made a lecture and it was a packed hall. And, um, you know, Oxford is Oxford is a big name um, and uh, uh, everybody was there. In fact, in that time, there were more Oxford, there were more Oxford's graduates in the Pakistan cabinet than there were in the British cabinet. <laughs> and that was, that was during Mrs. Thatcher's time, and we we thought that actually we weren't sure um, which country was being better run because both of them had problems, of course. Um, so we were joking about that. But the point I wanted to tell you, which is uh, quite, I, I think, is quite an amusing story. So when the Vice Chancellor um, Sir Peter North had finished his his talk, um, the a huge crowd came to the dais. And he walked up to, to greet them. And they walked straight past him and came up to greet me. And I was totally shocked. And they all said, you know, you're, you're uh, this is uh, echoing Kesha, you're, you're, you're your Saganga Ram's grand, you're, you're a descendant. You know, we want to touch you. And oh uh, my God. it was so embarrassing because I was the sort of Batman. I was the, you know, the, I was his aide. I was his lieutenant. I was, I mean, I was, you know, I was a senior figure at the university, but he was the boss. Um, but it just shows the power of the man. Wonderful. Mr. Puram, there is a question di directed at you uh, where this person is asking that, uh, you know, that, uh, it seems that you are not. Uh, so, what attracted you to Sir Gangaram and his legacy? 
so much so that you are now writing a biography on him. You know, frankly speaking, I can't remember why I came to this because I, I know that I kept hearing about him from various, you know, and the, and the hospital, of course. But then suddenly I, I discovered there were layers within the, within that, below that, that had to be discovered and uncovered. And uh, so I said, I must do something about this. And I just started reading and looking at, uh, I think I spoke to you also. And then I discovered, yes, there was really so much to tell, so much to describe uh, about this person, so much to learn for other people who want to learn, you know, from his example. It was such a long time ago. And yet he was, as everybody says, so far ahead of his time. And uh, that had to be drawn out uh, and made into a, a narrative for everybody to read. So I hope that even our school children will read it. It will be a simple a kind of book, I hope, and it will be, you know, maybe translated into Urdu someday so people can read it because I know there are a lot of Urdu programs uh, on BBC and all on him in Urdu language. Uh, so, yes, mm -hmm. even the book should be in Urdu because and I, I, and think I think that the government picks, picks it up, you know, now, now, you know, a single national curriculum, you know, these are the kinds of figures uh, and, uh, you know, chapters on them that they should include. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I just want, I really wanted to hear that answer because I, I know we're all so grateful, Poonam, that you're writing a book. Um, you know, we, we have, I have Man of All Seasons, the other biography, and it's quite a catalog, you know, of his accomplishments. And, um, you know, I hope we get deeper into the stories that we have and they're reflected in more of a sense of his life. I unfortunately have to go. Um, I have a quite a busy day. Um, it was so wonderful to be with all of you. Um, I don't know if we're wrapping up, but um, I'm happy to I can talk about it all day, but <laughs> happy to do this anytime. Great. Yeah, of course, thanks, wonderful. thanks, Kecha. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you in Lahore, hopefully in the next you know couple of years. Very soon. Uh, Absolutely. We don't know if you can go before that. God yes. willing. Or Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have two more questions here left, uh, if I can ask them. Uh, well, first thing, actually, K Kesha might have, might have answered, well, helped answer that. But there is one thing that um, uh, one of the questions is, um, how can Sir Gangaram speak as a Hindu uh, with uh, some Sikh connection? How can Sir Gangaram speak to a country that's Muslim majority? Hmm. Well, I... Uh think that there is space and the very fact that he is Sikh and Hindu really gives him a lot more of you know space and amplitude because as you know right now we are all sort of head scratching about uh, why we never accepted the legacies of all the Sikhs and of, of recognizing them in our history books and uh, so I think there's not an issue at all I mean I think that yes there was a reticence maybe early on about him being a Hindu and uh, therefore pushing him a little away from you know the limelight, but I think that's that time is gone, and I think once again, as you know, uh, we're doing a lot of research and people are doing a lot of work on all these contributions from all these different people from different faiths, and uh, so hopefully, yes, I think that that time is over. I think I think that's right. I think I think it, it it's his example that he that that you know we can all live and work together that is just so vital now i mean in the end pakistan and india have got to improve their relations we all agree on that um we'll, we'll just we'll, we still need to find a decent pathway towards that but um he 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 illustrates and exemplifies a time when that was possible and when people you know just loved each other and worked worked together and um were generous, um, and as uh, as we as we've all been talking about, I mean, he is he is part of the shared history. He is he is a so you know, there's a romance. There's 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 just a so I think I think in that sense. But even if one puts aside um, religion and puts aside politics with a capital P, not politics with a small P, um, because I think he was hugely political. I think we're all political in, in, in our different ways, but he was hugely influential. Um, it was, it was, he, he showed how you could build a, a caring society. And that, and that matters, 
you know, how, how you could care for different parts of the community, how you could be generous, how you could be philanthropic, how you could solve problems. Um, these are all wonderful qualities that, you know, everyone needs, every country needs. Our human qualities, yeah. So there's, there's the one last question that I have. Yeah. yeah, the one last question which I've got is, uh, can anyone ex uh, talk about uh, Sir Gangaram as an agriculturist? Uh, because that is where he made his money. And uh, in fact, you know, the last thing, and of course that's, well, now my my addition to the question is, uh, that that was the last honor that actually Sir Gangaram had when he was made uh, part of member of the Royal Agriculture Commission. And in fact, it was during its work that he, got so tired and, you know, of course it was age and, you know, uh, the labors of being on the commission that he finally passed away in London. Uh, so, yeah, so if uh, both of you could comment on his work as an agriculturist, as, as again, I would perhaps add on to the question saying as a very modern agriculturist who was looking far ahead uh, from his time about agriculture techniques and usage also. Who wants to start? Shall I start? Um Yes, you can because I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that, well, I mean, I, I can tell you a few things that he achieved, and we've talked about them. You know, uh, um, in a sense, using his his lift system to irrigate what was wasteland or, or desert land. So one could draw from that the inference that he, you know, he had a, a deep ecological sense that he, you know, land mattered. Uh, food mattered. He 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 was he used to experiment with different crops and different seeds, and he you know he he cared about um, uh, ensuring that there was sufficient. I mean, food production for him was vital because he he did want to ensure that everybody was fed. That you know nobody could operate unless they uh, unless hunger was dealt with. And yes, it, it slightly came by accident because when he was in Patiala, I think they. He was rewarded with some uh, hundreds of acres of barren land, and he um, uh, started to, to to investigate how best to do it through through the irrigation systems. And then one thing led to another, uh, and you know it's it, it's 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 a lovely story, but it's not it's not the right time to tell it all. And he he um, his focus on. I think, uh, um, as I say, you know, using land wisely, using water wisely, uh, developing new seeds, which in a sense heralded the, the famous Green Revolution of the 60s, um, experimenting and quality control, checking things, monitoring. These are all um, principles that I think have an echo today, don't they? What do you think, Poonam? Actually, you know, um, yes, you're right. Absolutely. You mentioned when he was in Patiala, that was when he retired and he got his first 20,000 acres of gift as a retirement of benefit. And he was very excited because he, it was something he really wanted to do. So off he sent his son, Sevakram. He said, go and start and I'll, I'll join you later. So Sevakram already began a lot of the work on these lands. And when he got there, he, he realized that, yes, there's so much potential. So then he, he got additional land. And I think it all ended up in as 80,000 acres at the end. But at the same time, it was, uh, I think, the world First World War, and uh, they needed soldiers, the British. And they had to give them land as a, as a compensation for going to war. And they had to open up more land. And that's where Sagangaram played a very big role. And he said, look, you give me land, I will irrigate it myself. And they gave him a certain time. And he managed to finish it. And they said, look, if you don't finish it, you'll give us all the land, give us all the machinery and everything else with it. But he finished it. He finished the work in time. And uh, so, yes, it was like by the time, I think by the 1925, he had done wonders with that land. And then he'd begun to diversify, as I told you. He'd set up little factories. He was looking at cattle farming in a, in a rational way. He was looking at tree production for fuel separately and so that you know they could free up uh, a lot of the uh, trees that were just being cut you know at random and he said eucalyptus was the best tree and they will grow just eucalyptus for fuel and um, so uh, basically his interest in agriculture had been there but he you know, he owned it by learning and uh, he went to england on a very large study tour for about 
almost eight, 10 months a year with his son immediately after Patiala and came back with a lot of machinery, bought himself, he had bought it himself and he um, set up these uh, the steam um, energy for uh, irrigation. Then he set up the electric uh, energy, as you know, the Rinala Khurd, which was a very big success and it still runs. The Rinala the hydro, plant. The hydro plant, plant, yes. Hydro plant, yes. The hydroelectric plant. plant. So that uh, as, as, as initial uh, land, 20,000 acres, was in the irrigated belt. So that actually was very prosperous land. And that's where they made a lot of capital. And that capital is all that all went back into the, you know, the further agri agricultural work that he carried out in other and very dry areas, higher areas. And then his uh, special lift irrigation system then reached water to these higher areas from the canals. And that's how he, he, he irrigated completely dry highlands and uh, where just shrubs grew and uh, they were fertile fields. And as Paul says, yes, food production also multiplied in a big way. So he was able to avert any kind of famine. Green Revolution, of course, came much, much later. But as I said, he created land for the soldiers to be given as, as a compensation for going to war. Thousands of acres of land was given to the British. Just, you know, his, his um, work, I mean, it's just his uh, volunteer work. It wasn't that as he was being paid for it in a big way. He just wanted to show them that, yes, he can do it. And he did it. So, yeah, that was agriculture was his big dream. And it, it, it he worked magic with it. And Gangapur, of course, is another story, separate story, which is community. I think, I think Gangapur is a good story. I think that we don't want to, uh, I mean, I think agriculture is a great thing, but he's also interested in industry. So very, very popular. interesting. Yes. So, you know, he. what I think is remarkable is that usually, usually, people industry, in, interested in industry are neglectful of agriculture. That's and right. Possibly, he married and, and possibly the other way around. But he, you're right, he you're if right. you're looking for, uh, to, to go back to the thrust of the question, Yakub, if you're looking for what lessons for today, it's that he saw the interaction between them. Um, and so, you know, when he was thinking about agriculture, he could think about, you know, cottage industries and, and small plants and things which Poonam has mentioned and developing um, uh, systems, um, even local banks and that kind of thing. So little, little kind of uh, community setups to make agricultural centers work better. Um, and the model was obviously Gangapur. But he also saw the, I mean, he's quite an economist in his own way, and he saw the value of industry and the value of, of production and the value of growth. Um, and, and I think that's, that, in that sense, he was ahead of his time. Sure, absolutely. I mean, that's why I called that uh, talk, A Man for All Seasons. I see my friend uh, took, the, took my talk and put it into a, a book. But I think well, he did know, it bad. I think he did it bad. That was my lecture. That the, that the Mr. Butty, who was my, yes. he was a he was a he he was he worked with me. He was a teacher at a school. I was oh. in charge of London education, and uh -huh. he came to me one day and said, "I live in Lahore. You're the relative of Gangaram. Would you give a lecture about him?" So I gave this lecture, and he brought me to Lahore, and we went to Gangapur and so on. And he filmed it all, and I gave the lecture. And the next thing I knew is he disappeared, and then this book appeared. Um, um, but but I, I gather it's not a good book. So um, I'm, am I'm amazed, Paul, because he didn't even mention uh, you in the preface. It's it's and an absolute steal. Steal. It's an absolute steal. And you know the, the he, what he did mention was that some of his relatives in India sent him funding and wanted this book written. That's his story in the preface. So I wanted to ask the Gangaram Heritage Foundation that published this book. But that was true or well, not? Maybe maybe that, that was true. Maybe, maybe that was true. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe the foundation it. helped him. I don't know, but it was. They did. Uh, they did. It was quite astonishing. And uh, what was depressing for me was that all the materials which I left with him, you know, which he was, ah. uh, um, you know, I, I don't know where they are. I mean, all interviews we did, and everything was organised through me because he couldn't get access to anywhere. You know, just. Well, the book is no longer available, as you know. It's no longer. Oh, I didn't available. know. I didn't know. Yes, that. it's not available anywhere. I've got yeah, a photocopy. I've never seen it. But, yeah, I got uh, a photo of the foundation. 
they send me a photocopy. They send me a photocopy. Just I, I think I might write a, a little amusing piece about uh, the, the mechanics of the book. <laughs> Why um, don't you? <laughs> I was very depressed. I mean, it threw me off everything. Uh -huh. I was very depressed for. Uh -huh. Well, suddenly, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Everything I lost everything and so on. I've been doing all this work. Maybe that's why you ignored uh, me. <laughs> it, it isn't. It isn't disconnected. I mean, I I just felt uh, very, very uh, I felt very um, upset about it all. You know, um, oh, that's um, very sad. Yeah. yeah. At yeah. least now we know. Anyway, <laughs> we're rehabilitated. Interested. I'm glad. That's I didn't. Good I didn't ignore you deliberately. I think I was quite busy. I didn't. Okay. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Lily, it's 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 it's, uh, it's uh, good, but it's uh, it's it's also you know at some level, of course, it's it's awful that all of this was stolen. But at some <laughs> level, it's also heartening that you know, okay, the person thought that Sir Gangaram's you know legacy and information about him a hundred years down the line is still so important that you need to s s steal it. So uh, yeah. in that sense, I think this is you know something interesting in that level. But but uh, Putin, I just I, I just wanted to ask you since you've been working on Saint Gagaram for a few months now at least, um, has has there been a kind of a wow moment? Like which moment practically has been a wow moment for you uh, where you've been amazed? Because of course, as as you said in your answer earlier that you were just fascinated by his life because it was just multi-layered and multifaceted one. Uh, but has there been kind of a wow moment that you've been really kind of thrown off and said, wow, this, this is just amazing or something? Actually, the wow moment is actually many moments. It's it's his, his lifestyle, which I was amazed with. And this is described by, you know, Pyaral Al Bedi, the kind of disciplinarian life he led. Very simple and Spartan and very, very regimented, you know, and that's what made him so vitally strong and healthy on all his life till the end. He could work the way he did at so many levels. And uh, unfortunately, at the end, I don't know what is it that, uh, you know, made him weak. He was 72 or three, I think, when he passed away. There was no age at all. And he was still in the prime of his agricultural work, you know, and in all of that. And he was he was excited. He was wanting to take Gandhi to London with him at that trip. He wanted to sort of do things for the, you know, independence of India. And, all you know, he didn't he didn't get a chance to do that. So, yes, I'm talking about how the life he led as a person and the, the hours he kept and that he would start his day at 2 a.m. And that's when he would sit up. Yeah, he would sit up and start reading his files. Wow, and then wow. he'd yes, yes. And then he and then he'd play tennis for one hour in the evening before he came home from office at 6 wow. o'clock, 6. Yeah. So, so, so I guess if you are able to achieve half of it in a, in a, in a day, that will be amazing. <laughs> yes, but that's where all his energy came from, his lifestyle. And his, you know, his simple lifestyle and very regimented, as I said. So that was really, I was really amazed at that, among so many other things. Of among course. so many other things, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that your work by the end of it will be, I think, one fascinating chapter after another, because again, you know, there are yes. just so many things. And one of the things that I think Paul also kind of just quickly mentioned, but I do want to underscore that being an academic myself, uh, that we mustn't forget his academic contributions. Uh, you know, the Haley College of Commerce, uh, which is a constituent college of yes. Punjab University. Uh, that was the first college of commerce in the whole area, in, you know, in the whole region. And this is the first time that commerce, rather than something uh, sort of, you know, taught practically, uh, was uh, treated as an academic discipline too. Uh, Subject, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I learned that through, uh, again, this is again fascinating, when I was in the U.S., an American professor of mine told me that, oh, you know, the first modern kind of college of commerce was actually established in Lahore. And I was kind of like surprised. And I was like, wow, in South Asia, that was in Lahore. Uh, and then it turned out to be the Haley College of Commerce, which, of course, was endowed by Sir Gangaram. So, you know, I, I think there are very few kind of facets of life that where Sir Gangaram did not have a very clear, marked uh, uh, impact. And I think that is, again, you know, uh, perhaps all your chapters will actually be, you know, show, show that, that, you know, there's just one thing after another. Uh, in fact, a tiring list because you just, by the end of it, imagine that why was it even possible for him to, you know, indulge in all these things and actually do them really well. You know, as actually That's Paul great. said, he was, a, he, was a, he, he was a problem solver. He was a doer. So he actually did all these things. It's not as if that he actually began them and it never finished. During his lifetime, one could see fruits of all these things. And he let it, let Sir Haley take the name for the college, uh, you know, yeah. even though it was his brainchild, it was his own bungalow, 
a lot of his money uh, and yet he said to Saheli, please name it after you because he was the governor of something of law of Punjab at that time. Yeah, that's, and, that's good politics. Good politics. Yes, he was very sensible. And then Sir Haley could just never ever get over the indebtedness he felt towards him, right? I mean, after his death. But what I wanted to tell you was something else uh, interesting to do with this college. When Pakistan was being made and my father was in the Pakistan movement, he met Jinnah. And they were students at that time. And, and they all said, you know, ask Jinnah, what do you want? What do you advise us to do? He said, listen, all of you must go into the field of commerce and finance because that's what Pakistan would need tomorrow. And there was already the Haley College of Commerce in Lahore. So off my father went into good mission there. But when I came across the fact that Sir Gangaram had to do with this college, and I asked my father, did you know that? He says, no. Oh, I was so okay. hurt. Yeah. I was so petrified and so hurt that this could be possible. So I said, this book has to come out. <laughs> and you now have a personal college. you have a personal connection to Sir Gangaram. Yes, I have a personal connection that I have to come actual personal connection. Yes. <laughs> That's right, and his dream of how 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 they had to go ahead of times and and you know make the young yeah. people aware. And, the need for and look and look what what it actually did. You know, uh, your father was the first generation of uh, uh, you know economic civil servants that Pakistan yes. produced. That's, that's uh, and in true. fact, you know, one of the one of the saddest things Pakistan has is that you know he's he still remains one of the one of the top ones. Which means after that, what we have done to our institutions, we haven't produced more. Uh, that's right. And at that time, yeah. we were able to produce these great names through these great insti institutions. But I think you know that's a very important point that you've made. That you know there should be recognition within the Haley College of Commerce that who was the first yes. you know who endowed the whole college and paid for it. And you know, yes. it was his yes. it was money that was established uh, that was used yes. to establish. I, I shall go knocking on their door very soon. Uh, I, unfortunately, mobility has been limited because of this Corona COVID uh, you know situation. So I've not been able to go to Lahore. I've not been able to go to Gangapur. I have to travel even now, even if I've done my book, I'm still going to go and see these places. So yes, I'm going to go and knock at Haley College's door and say, where is his portrait? <laughs> <laughs> no, quite certain, quite certain. Anyways, I think uh, since I'm, I'm, I was supposed to be the person to to say that you know our hour is up, but after one hour and twenty two minutes, <laughs> I've just seen uh, the clock. And can you imagine? Uh, we haven't felt it. The, we could just go on no, for another one or so, no. and our students could pick up the book and we could go like chapter by chapter, and then you know yes. be six months by the end of it. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, both of you, and of course thanks to Kesha who. Uh, also con contributed really well, and I think uh, well, this is uh, I should say not the not the first and last. This is the first of many conversations we will have uh, when Poonam's book is actually out. I hope we the the conditions will be such that you know we can have this panel in person, live, uh, yes. yeah, live, yes. uh, and then actually you know. Uh, if 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 again you know uh, we can kind of kind of time it you know have the panel and then take a bus full of people around these areas you know actually I physically know. show them what yes. Gangara did for the city yes. what he built as yes. as as the engineer uh, and then what he endowed uh, and all his philanthropy and I think you know you can just do a Gangara tour of uh, Lahore and even you know beginning perhaps from his birthplace which is you know just just what 40 45 miles miles away yes. and I think that would again sort of help us appreciate that and I would want to really end on from where I where I began that a lot of people think that you know when we talk about these these things we are talking about history but we're actually talking about now he he was a man that was way ahead of his time he was a very modern man and most importantly i think we must underscore that his legacy speaks to us today in, in a number of ways and that is why he is still very important for us to understand and interact with and his thought is still very critical for us so it's not something that you know happened 100 years ago it is something current and it is something that we really need to engage with to develop a more humane society you know very simple thing which was gangaran's principle was to develop a, a humane society but anyways uh, any last words from uh, uh, punam and uh, paul and then we'll kind yeah, of uh, i just want to send my best wishes and my compliments to paul's mother you know and i we really do miss her we could have seen a little bit of her today it would be wonderful but really, her presence is very much felt around. We feel that, you know. Well, I'll, you know certainly, I'll certainly pass that on. She'll be all night. Yes, please. Yes, please. She, 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 she's on the way back. So that, that's great. Nice. Wonderful. Thanks, thanks, thanks for organizing this session and for putting a, a great man in the limelight. I think that's uh, that's been terrific. I think we've all learned from each other and from and now from him. Yes. So, and of course, Paul, Paul resembles him a lot. <laughs> 
They have said that. They have said that. I have mocked up. I have mocked myself up to in his clothes. <laughs> ah, right. Okay. A mocked up image somewhere. But anyway. Chale, chale. But I had some, what a yeah. brilliant, okay. magnif magnificent yeah. man. Yes. Chale, great. Well, well, thank you both. And uh, hope to see both of you in person soon. All right. Cheers. Yes. Yes. All the best.